So yeah, good morning to friends uh, from the US, US uh, good afternoon friends from UK and uh, Europe and uh, good evening to all uh, of all friends joining from India and uh, Singapore. I'd like to extend a warm welcome uh, to everyone here today for third of the legal town hall series. Uh, before I uh, jump into the event, I'd like to uh, extend my heartfelt thanks to all the frontline COVID warriors who've been keeping the country and the globe uh, safe while we are able to work within the confines of our homes. I'm Jidesh Kumar and uh, I'm the managing partner of King Seven Kasiva. I'll be your co-moderator today. Uh, co-moderating this session along with me today is uh, Paramjit Singh. Uh, Param is partner and head of the India practice of Evershed Sutherland, uh, one of the largest global law firms. Um, he's uh, got uh, diversified uh, interests in uh, real estate, diversified in, in uh, industrials. In uh, today's event, uh, we uh, are meeting uh, GCs from across the world uh, who have uh, operational expertise and functional expertise extending um, all the way from India to other continents, including Asia, Africa, Australia, Europe, North and South America. Uh, today, we intend to discuss uh, the challenges faced by the in-house community, uh, not just Indian, but the global in-house community, um, and also try and understand what are the solutions, opportunities, and the key learnings during the pandemic. To discuss this and more, we have with us a distinguished panel of uh, guests. Uh, before I introduce them to you, I wanted to go through a few housekeeping items and share the format in which we'll be conducting this session. The entire session will be for about an hour and 30 minutes. Uh, for the first hour, we'll be uh, doing the panel discussion. Uh, I, during this, I'll encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A box on your screens. Once uh, the discussions uh, with the panelists is complete, we'll open the floor for questions uh, for uh, about 25 to 30 minutes. Uh, please use the raise hand icon on Zoom and we'll unmute your lines one by one and you can actually ask your questions live. Um, you're also requested to identify yourself and stick to the questions posted. Um, let me now um, go ahead and introduce our panel here today. Um, I'm going to be introducing the uh, panel from outside India and I will definitely I'll let uh, Param introduce uh, our panel from India. Uh, Firstly, uh, I, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Abhijit Mukhopadhyay. Abhijit is joining us from London. He is the President, Legal and General Counsel for Hinduja Group, uh, with whom he's been for around 19 years. And uh, before this, he also was associated with Ranbaxi Labs, Maruti Suzuki, Dunlop. So welcome, Abhijit. Next, we have Thank uh, you. next we have Chaitanya. Uh, Ramachandran, uh, Chaitanya is uh, joining us from C Singapore and Chaitanya is the Senior Legal Counsel Asia Pacific Region for Twitter. Uh, before this, he was also with Clifford Chance, a London, um, a UK law firm, uh, and also with uh, Shardul Amarshan Mangalas. Next, uh, I'm, uh, welcome Chaitanya. Thanks. Next, uh, I'm glad to introduce you to Vinod. Vinod heads uh, ETG and is based in Dubai and oversees ETG's global functions. Uh, Vinod used to also head lifestyle. Um, welcome Vinod to the event. Thank you, Param, uh, now I uh, uh, leave it to you to take up uh, from here. Thank you very much, uh, Jidesh, and uh, thank you to Jidesh, uh, my dear friend, and to uh, Lex Witness today for giving us the opportunity to uh, co-moderate uh, this uh, legal town hall. So uh, welcome to everybody who's joined us today. I'm delighted to introduce, firstly, uh, uh, Deepak. Uh, Deepak joins us uh, from Mumbai, and he's the director and head of legal for uh, Wellspun Group. Uh, before he joined uh, Wellspun Group, uh, Deepak was uh, vice president and Head of Legal uh, for GBK Power and Infrastructure. Uh, and he's also had uh, stints uh, with Gammon Infrastructure as well. So uh, welcome today, uh, Deepak. Okay, good to see you. And then uh, next we've got uh, Nilanja, uh, who joins us from Mumbai. Uh, he serves as the Head of uh, Legal for ICICI Bank, uh, covering India 
and uh, Southeast uh, Asia. Uh, he has vast experience of working with uh, several prestigious groups, including the uh, Goodraj, uh, uh, Godridge and the Boyce uh, Group, Marsh and uh, McLennan uh, companies, Yes Bank and uh, Exide Industries. So uh, welcome to uh, Nilanjir as well today. So thanks, Param, uh, for this. Uh, without any further ado, let's uh, dive straight in and uh, kick off this uh, legal town hall. Uh, my first question is to Vinod. Vinod, uh, what are the key attributes of an effective general counsel during this crisis? Thanks, Chang Dijesh, and good evening, everyone. So, in my view, the key attributes uh, for a GC remain, uh, even, even during normal times or during a crisis, it remains the same. I think his, his role is always geared to, to handle crisis. So uh, to be an effective GC, uh, I think crisis management should be in the gene and it, it's, it should be a critical skill set. And to be a good crisis manager, I think first and foremost, you need to, you need to retain a calm, calm demeanor. So as the saying goes, be like a duck, calm on the surface while uh, paddling furiously underneath. Uh, senior, senior management, including the board, uh, rely on the GC uh, in times of crisis and obviously uh, they do not want to rely on somebody who himself is in a panic mode or is perceived to be so. So I think that is uh, the first and foremost and a key attribute. Uh, secondly, I think you should keep your eyes and ears open for any disruptions in your industry. Um, it could be threats, it could be opportunities. I think when you do that, you stay ahead of the curve, you stay ahead of the game, and uh, you're able to handle crisis uh, in a more appropriate manner. Uh, I think the last uh, last one might be, might sound a little bit cliched, but uh, I think a successful GC uh, always has to be a good commercial lawyer. Uh, that is a commercially astute business lawyer. And I think this should be more so in times of a crisis, uh, because uh, you would all agree that crisis uh, presents a lot of opportunities. I think so during these times, I think you need to support your business in grabbing those opportunities. Uh, while at the same time, you need to you should not lower your guard and, and, uh, and perform your role as a lawyer. So I think these three are, in my my view, key attributes. Thank you, uh, Vinod. Uh, that was very insightful. Uh, Nilanjan, uh, what are your uh, views on this? Hi, uh, you know, thank you, Jitesh, and greetings to everyone. Uh, Obhijda, great to see you, seeing you in in person after a long time. You know. Uh, uh, but uh, thank you, Lex Fitness, and, and all of you to for inviting me for this. Uh, you know, I, I uh, you know I think uh, what what uh, to me the attributes first is that you've got to think about yourself now as a wartime leader. You know, you are uh, in a crisis. You are you know you have to really think of what does uh, a military general do at during wartime. So you got to first and foremost be like a wartime leader, uh, which means that you have to lead from the front, uh, which means, you know, the, the, you know, the military generals do two things is what I understand. One, they lead from the front. Uh, two, they also start empowering their people to take decisions on the, uh, at the epicenter. Uh, so I think uh, uh, one of the key attributes will be that how do you, how do you actually be able to manage that and, how do you able to? How are you able to sort of really uh, create that atmosphere? Uh, uh, that's sort of the first attribute. Uh, the second attribute to me is that you have to be decisive. You know, as as a leader, uh, I think any which way. I think uh, you know. I, I know. I know. Jitesh may not be politically correct addressing it to you, but uh, you know, the one of the big differences between an in-house lawyer and an external lawyer is that we don't hedge our decisions. We don't qualify our decisions. We've got to look in the eye of our, our business leader and give a decision. Uh, this is more so uh, you know, a, a time where you cannot hedge your decisions uh, with qualifications. Uh, that's the, the second big attribute. Uh, the third uh, big attitude, attribute to me is that you have to also ensure, I think this was mentioned, uh, uh, you know, uh, also that you've got to ensure that no one takes advantage of the situation. It's very, very easy now at this time to sort of uh, take the easy way out, uh, cut corners, uh, you know, uh, 
sort of uh, make excuses for slack on integrity, on, on adherence to, to principles, policies, uh, in the garb of making quick buck, quick earning, short-term gains. So as a GC, you've got to be uh, very careful that you can't let uh, you know, anybody take advantage and let your guard down on that. Uh, uh, I think a uh, couple of other things and uh, is that, uh, of course, uh, in, in every crisis, the, the most important attribute for anybody is to show empathy and sensitivity. Uh, you have to have, uh, you have to show empathy. Uh, you have to uh, look at everything with a lot more empathy uh, and be sensitive to situations people are dealing with. It will be a mental health situation people are dealing with. You know, people are dealing with abnormal you know, circumstances, which is why it's crisis. Uh, and to be able to understand and connect. And then that leads to me to the other point of saying that, uh, uh, you know, the other attribute is that how do you communicate or at the risk of over communicating, you know, uh, and, and empathy will come when you over communicate and, and you know, certainly communicate. Uh, uh, so, so those, of course, uh, are, are some of the uh, I think key attributes, I would say, uh, as a general counsel. And, uh, and, you know, keeping in mind that this is the time where resources are scarce, scarce uh, and therefore, you know, having a laser focus on, on operating expenses. You know, uh, uh, that's, that's uh, you know, th things you could have done earlier. Uh, you got to think uh, 20 times, uh, you know, should I do that? Uh, do I need to spend that money? Uh, do I need to engage, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and spend time? So uh, I would say, I mean, I'll stop here and, you know, uh, but, but I think these are at least some of my thoughts of, of what uh, would be sort of the, the key attributes uh, anybody would. I think whether it's a GC or whether it's a leader in business, uh, one has to look for during crisis. Thank you, Dilajan, for that. Uh, Abhijit, uh, the GC sometimes takes the role of the conscious uh, keeper of the company, along with being a, a business enabler, enabler. How do you successfully collaborate with the CEO, other C-level um, directors, or the board as a public or a listed company uh, GC? Thanks, Maram. A great question. I think uh, the role of GC as a business in a blur, vis-a-vis -vis conscience keeper, they remain all the time, whether there is COVID or whether there is no COVID. Now, most of the time, I find that in-house legal faces a very classic dilemma. Should they remain as strict legal person or should they become a bit flexible, try to help the business? I think for, for me, the fundamentals is that we exist because businesses are there. If businesses do not exist, let us be very clear, no organization, no promoter, no shareholder will keep us in our job. So it is our duty to make sure that businesses not only survive, businesses even prosper. But even for a second, I am not telling or suggesting that it means that we should allow them to do all kinds of unethical job. Let us be very clear, businesses, most of the jurisdictions operate legally. It is not that they want to do business other than law or other than in a lawful way. That is not the issue. But most of the time as somebody who manages the legal affairs of really a conglomerate and we have got 150,000 people working in more than 65 countries, our global turnover is $18 billion. It's a very big business because we have got more than 12 business verticals in uh, core areas of the economy. So therefore, I think the challenges that I face as a general counsel of such a global conglomerate is that businesses come to me as someone who can provide some kind of solution. It is not that they come to me with some problem and they go back with their problem unresolved. So you have to have some kind of very good business knowledge, what the businesses do, what are their difficulties, 
how do they manage make the business leaders as your esteemed colleague and what not even as friends also so that they should think of you even if there is absolutely no problem they should think of you more as a problem solver than anything else so it's a very big challenge and i think a general counsel can become very effective if he maintains the balance between the two both at conscience keeper as well as someone who is really a friend of the business i always say that my effectiveness will be judged how many times i get calls on a daily basis from the businesses asking for help not the other way around to work as some kind of teacher and find out what they are doing that is the yardstick of my success well i be i think that's an observation that people like myself and jidesh that work uh, at law firms can take away as well to, in terms of finding solutions for clients and obviously having those deep uh, friendship uh, relationships. So thank you very much for that thoughtful answer. Uh, Deepak, if I could ask you, what are your thoughts on that as well, please? First of all, thanks, Param. Thanks, Yudesh. Thanks, Lex, witness for having me on this webinar. I completely, first of all, echo what uh, Abhijit mentioned. It's completely, you know, to the point and very relevant. Uh, in our case as well, we've got uh, several listed entities within the group. As a general counsel, you collaborate with at least three stakeholders within the company. One is, of course, the CEO and the CXO level. The expectation there clearly is, you know, they are looking for strategic issues, financial implications, complex structures. But again, the advice needs to be very simple at all times. The advice cannot be as complex and be, you know, shouted in any manner it needs to come out very very clearly simple advice practical implementable solutions balanced win-win approach is what they're looking for and when it comes to the board which typically comprises of uh, nominee directors from banks from uh, uh, lenders from insurers from uh, investors you typically find that they are looking for governance issues compliance issues they become very prominent when they are looking at any anything that you you know deal with then those issues are crucial for them. Transparency becomes vital. Whenever you deal with other general counsel, whenever you deal with them, they need to find you as somebody who will tell them transparently what is right and what is wrong very, very clearly. And then not to forget the third level, which is of course the promoters. For them, reputational issues become extremely important. You know, you've got to deal with them. When you deal with them, you need to keep the big picture in in view all the time, you know, because they have visions which go across businesses, go across. So those are the three main stakeholders with whom you deal with and you need to be responsible to all three. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, over to uh, Kidesh. Sure. Thanks, uh, Deepak. Uh, I think both uh, Abhijit and uh, Deepak, I think both your responses were absolutely insightful, very useful for the community and also like Param said, to law firms like ourselves where we can help uh, you know, figure out the right solutions for uh, uh, companies. Uh, Chaitanya, over to you now. Uh, what are the uh, top five challenges that uh, you as a company or you as a GC are facing uh, during uh, the pandemic? Um, first of all, Jidesh, uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, such a privilege to be uh, part of such a distinguished panel. Um, Challenges that uh, I'm facing during the pandemic. Uh, I have to say the first one is the pandemic itself. I think most of us have uh, at some point, you know, watched uh, one of these uh, blockbuster apocalyptic movies thinking that, uh, you know, it's very unlikely that we'd ever find ourselves in a situation like that. But here we all are. And I think having been in uh, lockdown for months, uh, having been in this situation of, uh, I think most of us are working remotely, um, at times, it, it's sometimes easy to lose sight of, you know, what's happening out there in the wider world. But the reality is that there is uh, still untold uh, suffering uh, out there in the wider world uh, and massive uh, global disruption. Uh, so I think it's, it's very sobering to, uh, you know, think that this, this is the world we're living in right now. So I think that's, that's probably the, the first and the most important. Um, the next thing I would say that's posing a challenge is... Uh, a general level of uncertainty about the future. I think at this point of time, um, it's really anyone's guess when uh, things will get back to something resembling what 
we once thought of as being uh, normal circumstances. Uh, you know, nobody really knows what the life cycle of the, the pandemic is going to be. Uh, and more importantly, the temporary changes uh, or the changes that we currently think of as being temporary to the way that we work and do business, uh, you know, many of them are probably going to end up becoming permanent and we, we don't know which, which, which ones those are. So I think, I think that uncertainty is definitely uh, very challenging. Um, I think another major challenge is just the, the way we work uh, day to day. I think the lockdowns and this period of extended working from home has completely broken and upended uh, the normal rhythms of day-to-day uh, -day work. I think most of us may have some experience, uh, you know, uh, part, doing part-time part, part, uh, part -time, uh, remote work. Uh, but I think for most of us, this is the first time that we are indefinitely working remotely full-time, uh, conducting all our meetings uh, with internal stakeholders, with external customers, 100% uh, remotely. Uh, on a personal level, trying to maintain some semblance of balance between uh, our work life and our personal lives. Um, so that uh, disruption to our normal rhythms of work, I think, is something that most of us are still challenging with, uh, still contending with to a greater or lesser degree. But at the same time, I do think that it does present tremendous opportunities for the future. Because uh, if some of the changed ways that we're working now get normalized in the future, I think it can introduce a lot of efficiencies. Uh, it can really improve uh, the way that we uh, work. And I think the, the, the best example is uh, not having to commute. I think that, that saves most of us so much time in a day that can be so much uh, better employed uh, towards more productive ends. Um, I think another thing, uh, zooming in a little bit more on um, legal work, um, I think the pandemic currently is looming very large over my day-to-day -day work uh, as, as an in-house lawyer. Um, I think when, when an issue comes up regarding a contract that uh, we've signed uh, maybe even years ago, uh, the, first, the first thing that always comes to mind is how, how does the pandemic impact our performance of this contract? How does it impact the counterparty's performance? Um, and then even uh, that, that spills over into uh, negotiating and signing new contracts. I think um, we are, most of us are probably seeing, uh, you know, uh, uh, custom language that we've been introducing into our contracts, especially short term contracts that have to be performed over the next three months, six months. Uh, and, uh, you know, managing risk in those contracts uh, uh, owing, uh, emanating from COVID-19. Um, and then I think litigation is another uh, big question mark. Uh, you know, for those of us who have uh, pending court cases, uh, you know, uh, what's, what's, what's going to happen to those cases? Uh, how long are they going to be in limbo? Uh, I think that's definitely something that uh, is a major uh, source of stress. Um, and I think finally, uh, just to conclude on a personal note, uh, I think uh, the uh, extreme limitations on, on uh, social contract uh, contact and interaction are a major challenge. Um, I think um, I'm much more used to doing remote meetings now um, than I was two months ago. But at the same time, I, I'm not 100% convinced that it's a perfect substitute for, uh, you know, meeting people in person. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chaitanya. <laughs> Uh, what are uh, what are the uh, being the GC of a global uh, global uh, con conglomerate? What are, what do you think are the top five challenges that you faced? First and foremost, challenge on an individual basis is to keep myself fit, both physically as well as mentally. You are always near to the kitchen, so always there will be a temptation. You raid your refrigerator and start eating. So refraining from getting into the kitchen, keeping myself fit, that's the first major challenge. And unless and until we succeed that challenge, we overcome that challenge, the rest of the challenges will all fail. Second challenge is that you have got the duty to not only keep your moral high, but also the motivation high for all the people whether they are working with you, whether they are your colleagues, or whether they are your own department. Because finally, at the end of the day, even business people, they are all human beings. Many times when I talk to them on a global basis, I find some colleagues, they will be under depression. So therefore, keeping their moral high, keep them motivated, is extremely important. 
third challenge is that you maintain effective quote unquote control over your people whom you are working with they are your department you are remotely asking them to work and there will be all kinds of people there so therefore very effective communication coordination are needed so that everybody is on the same page and as leader as gc i have to take that initiative fourth is that effective coordination with the promoter shareholder you know for us it's really a challenge because the ultimate owner of this huge business conglomerate is the hinduja family and there are nine members of the hinduja family sitting across the globe they manage their business and since i report to each one of them it's my duty to get in touch with them to take instructions and every time we are a very happening uh, organization it keeps happening businesses keep running all the time and you have to be in touch with them they have to be in touch with you so that coordination not only with your colleagues with your businesses but also with the promoter shareholders are extremely important and last but not the least fifth one is that you know you got to be very innovative and creative i can give my example on 16th of march i had a meeting with our group chairman and i told him that it is high time the way things are happening because we are in europe our global headquarters is in london it is better that we close it and he told me abhijit when do you want to close close means in our global headquarters in london i said close it from tomorrow so we just go home on 16th march night and then from 17th march nobody is coming to our global headquarters now this is a big challenge we are not used to work from home so then how to become very creative how to become innovative and how to remain so because we do not know when you are going back already almost 95 days are over we are all working from home so therefore to remain innovative creative all the time is a really a challenge this is the these are the five major challenges i can think of but i all support what my other panelists uh, have have said these challenges also will be there jitesh may i make a quick quick comment before uh, you move on if you may course, allow yes, Yes. I think the you know the other challenge, according to me, is the fact that work has come home today, and and the, the what that means is that you know I mean I'll tell you about my personal example. I have a pet, and because the air conditioner is on in the room I work, uh, he prefers to stay in the room where I work. So every time it's my chance to speak, he decides to bark. Now uh, you know how many times, and if it is God forbid, if it's a committee meeting. Uh, I, I mean, I I look uh, sheepish, uh, but that is actually uh, one of the big challenges. That you know, there is uh, how do you you know because the fellow in my home uh, believes that the house is his from nine to five, uh, and and now uh, suddenly it is not his. I, and and this actually you know while I'm trivializing it, but it is actually a very big challenge when because work has come home. I'm sorry, you know, just. Yes, that's fine. Where where is he now, though? Is it, I can't hear him. <laughs> I mean, yeah, today, fortunately, I, I because you know, uh, you all told me it's an important meeting. I decided to come to the office and work from the office. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, well, he's obviously missing you, so uh, that's great. Thank you for thank you very much for sharing that with us. Uh, just moving on, um, uh, in terms of Vinod, uh, in terms of the, what would you consider to be the, some of the key challenge changes that a GC has had to adopt, learn uh, during and post uh, covid uh, so no doubt the world has changed uh, we we may not we may not go back to the pre pandemic era and yeah. i think what we are witnessing is a paradigm shift in every industry every business the way they are operating you you name it schooling telemedicine even religious sermons are now going digital so i think the one more one most important thing is how how you work in this digital uh, environment i think it will be an understatement to say that uh, the workplace will embrace technology more so keeping this in mind i think i i thought about five things uh, i think two two aspects uh, my the fellow panelists have already touched upon which is work from home and how a corporate office is going to look like in the future but i would rather uh, uh, talk about 
two other things or three other things, uh, one of which is rapid reskilling. So as a GC, you should be able to able to have to ensure that your skill sets are effective and relevant in the digital platform as well. So uh, this may need uh, some real honing of skills and adaptation. Uh, and as a corollary to that is, I mean, this is not even not applicable, not just for GCs, but to every lawyer, uh, every in-house lawyer. I think uh, you need to move from the era of specialization. You need to be proficient in more, more than one area of law. For example, if you're doing litigation, I think it's time that you uh, pick up your skills and say in IP or contracts or M&A. Uh, so I think uh, the lawyer who's proficient in more than one branch of law or aspect of law would be in demand uh, going forward. Uh, the second is on communication. Uh, I, I think uh, the GC should 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 develop effective communication skills through through, through work on it on a, in a digital digital platform. Now that companies have gone fully virtual, uh, individuals are communicating more efficiently and more frequently across a, a network and environment. So here I'll, I'd like to take a personal example. Like we in ETG, we have legal teams which are operating in three different jurisdictions. And in Mumbai, in Dubai, and in Johannesburg. So obviously, it's 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 really difficult to uh, kind of network or engage uh, with with your um, with your team. So what we have done uh, at ATG is we have set up um, two hour sessions every week where we all connect on Teams. And what we do here is, I mean, uh, we we make one person, uh, one lawyer, to present on a topic which is relevant to his jurisdiction and uh, office specialization. So I, I think you achieve two two things here. One is uh, you get to engage, uh, the engagement across the team is improves. And secondly, obviously you improve, I mean, you, you start learning new things. So this has become a, a kind of a weekly future since the pandemic started. And I, I think we will continue to keep it going. Uh, the third thing in my view is um, motivation. I mean, I'm sure most of you would have had queries from your teams in terms of job security and uh, uh, longevity. So I, I think it, as a GC, you need to keep uh, the motivation levels in your team, and how do you do this? I think GC must provide crisp, outcome-driven expectations to the team so that they can deliver on goals successfully. So this would mean um, uh, motivating employees to perform will require modeling and measurement of their outputs. So I think uh, these three are, in my view, uh, uh, three important uh, aspects. And of course, I think work from home, which I think Abhijit and uh, uh, Niranjan have uh, referred to that, so I don't want to add on that. And of course, you need to adapt to the new way how corporate offices, obviously it's not going to look the same going forward. I mean, um, like most workplace changes, uh, it is not a complete replacement. Just as you, the resume did not go away with LinkedIn, I think the, the corporate office will be there, but I think in a much, in a, in a, in a different way than what uh, we look at it today. Thank you, Vinod. I, I don't think there's any doubt that uh, how we work in the future is going to change as a result of what's happened here. Uh, Ilanja, I, I just wondered whether you could just share with us uh, your, your top five changes that you're going to see in terms of the, what's going to, what, what do we learn, how we're going to adapt uh, during and I think crucially now, hopefully after uh, COVID-19. Yeah, you know, you know, in school when I was asked top five, I I normally gave seven answers because you know just to hedge that in case two, two are incorrect, uh, the five would still be correct. So if if you allow me, I, can I give seven, uh, 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 ch you know, such of things? Course. Yeah. Uh, you know, so so you know, I, I think uh, first, uh, I think the, the what we have to uh, adopt, learn, and adapt is technology. You know, uh, is that how do we sort of in our legal delivery system, uh, you know, as we call, uh, you know, an in-house lawyer also, as well as what y'all do, we do legal delivery of, of, our, of our job. And, you know, how do you do legal delivery using technology? And whether it is uh, through this uh, using various law tech uh, initi initiatives which have come up, whether it is, you know, to using being comfortable, uh, with a due diligence being done uh, using AI, or whether it is uh, you know using sort of uh, technology for doing your uh, negotiations, whether it is uh, uh, you know using technology for uh, creating you know consensus, uh, all of that you know I think that is what you have to one has to start uh, adopting, 
and then uh, and try and learn that and and get better at it. You know, uh, I think that's that's one, uh, which I think always was the reason, but uh, but now it has become more more evident. The second, uh, uh, you know, big one I, according to me is collaboration. You know, how do you collaborate? Uh, is is how do you learn remote collaboration? How do I uh, if I want to change uh, somebody's, you know, Chaitanya's view and uh, on, on something, uh, how do I look at him in, as, as a, you know, somebody in the screen? Uh, and uh, sometimes people switch off videos, so therefore you can't even say that you switch it on. So you're not in the same room, yet you have to get the person in the same room. Uh, how do you create that collaboration? Particularly, when, how do you create consensus when you are really have you know, uh, uh, disagreements uh, in, in, and I've always seen that it's easy when you're being able to read a body language of a person and then, you know, adapt to a body language, you know, what to push and then to pull out, you know, how much will, will you know, be too much. Uh, that collaboration, how do you create? And then, uh, so that's the other one. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the next one is that, you know, working with, and I meant alluded to this already, that how do you work with lesser resources you know uh, when you are uh, it, it could be simple things like uh, i'm used to and i'm still very old school i'm used to taking printouts of of anything which is important i need to read and be able to read that and uh, mark it up and then uh, walk into the meeting with my marked up draft uh, i am now i don't have that luxury when i'm i'm at home and i'm i'm working in this manner how do i still uh, do that can i you know uh, how do I, you know, this is just one example, but then there are similar things that you are really, uh, you know, in a situation where you are having lesser resources uh, to work with. Uh, you know, and, and I think to that it also is a lot of things now are a DIY mode. You know, today uh, you are uh, even simple things like having an executive assistant. Uh, you, you don't have the, uh, you know, luxury of an executive assistant. Uh, you are, uh, you know, at least I can talk about India, we are at least used to uh, having executive assistance from a very young age. Uh, and then uh, suddenly you're left with a situation that uh, you've got to manage uh, all of it yourself, whether it's your calendar, whether it is uh, a follow up for something, whether it is keeping track of things. Uh, and how do I, re how do you really do this uh, yourself? Uh, that's, uh, that's something which I think is a big challenge. And, and I must say, I, I personally speaking, uh, I, I struggled in the first few months when the first few days or weeks when it was, and I, 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 of course, there is no one to here in the room to vouch for it, but I personally think that I, I've got better at it. I've got better at, you know, being able to manage, uh, my stuff. I, I, uh, put everything down in my diary and calendar and stuff like that. Um, uh, so, so that's, that's the, uh, the thing. Uh, in India specific, there are, you know, two, uh, I think, specific risks in, you know, in which comes from India specific matters. And I don't know what's happening in the other jurisdiction. One is that we are having rapid change in law. You know, if, if one has tracked Indian, uh, India and jurisdiction, uh, you would see the number of legislations which have been uh, changes which have come. Uh, there are changes in, the, in, the, in, in our country. Uh, which covers, as I say, uh, all the fours. It covers liquidity, it covers land, it covers law, it covers labor. Uh, and, you know, there are these four L's uh, where there has been quite a paradigm kind of uh, change. They are not tinkering. How do you keep, uh, how do you sort of embrace these and, and try and, you know, in fact, just before this meeting, I was speaking to uh, somebody and he said, why are you busier than earlier? I said, I'm busier because there is so much of uh, law change to keep uh, and, and to sort of uh, keep abreast is the problem. The, uh, the other point is, is that, you know, there is a big change and a very rightly so, and our bank has been on the you know, uh, forefront of it is online dispute redressal. You know, how do we uh, sort of learn? How do we adapt? How do we embrace? How do we, you know, go on with it? Whether it's an online hearing of court, whether it is on, we are as a bank uh, propagating and, and pushing a lot on online dispute redressal, uh, which is uh, alternate dispute redressal, uh, ADRs and mediations. How do you, uh, how do you learn that skill? 
and uh, be able to uh, you know sort of uh, deliver on that skill so to me these are a few few uh, you know challenges uh, as i would say and i'm i'm sorry it's a long answer but but uh, I, I just thought i had to that's fine nilajan thank you very much i'm going to pass it back to judesh thank you um thank you uh, parun thanks a ton um deepak uh, quickly i'm also conscious of the fact that uh, we are already 45 min minutes into this uh, event and uh, all the answers are so interesting uh, so i'm sure you know um, the audience is also very interested because i i, I keep uh, seeing the audience notes and uh, so but let's try and keep the answers a little um, um shorter because we have some questions and we need to cover all so uh, to deepak uh, deepak what are your thoughts on how companies will embrace the new world especially real estate employees workplace once we return uh, to office after the pandemic so uh, this uh, very relevant question i feel the impact will be deep and it will be in many areas everlasting you know offices are bound to shrink from here on emphasis will be on delivery rather than physical presence you see the whole concept of being physically there is now not going to apply to a lot of functions legal included retaining talent will continue to be a challenge because retaining good talent good talent across is never you know going to go away the you know as a challenge i see a great opportunity at this time to build teams to train teams and you know do that sort of work at this time itself legal function will move as uh, abhijit also rightly mentioned nilajan also mentioned towards paperless going to move very much towards paperless like it or you don't like it you'll have to do that move more on common platform technologies where you can you know share draft where you can work you know in a very cohesive manner with other functions that's another change which will happen one more thing which uh, is going to happen is that we will have to reskill some of the talent within your in your own team for example the ip team today in wellspan started looking at it contracts ecom contracts so because they are very talented in terms of their technical know how and technical understanding of things so that reskill bit is extremely important and we've started doing that thank you uh, fantastic uh, thank you uh, deepak we know the over to you now uh, we know the you know um, the board and management teams uh, of companies at the c level are meeting more often now uh, than the statutory requirement Uh, especially during the pandemic so what has been there asked to you as a general counsel the board especially boards where there are independent directors i mean they have a responsibility to the shareholders and the management as the additional everyday role towards employees vendors banks financial institutions counterparties so on and so forth so uh, i think this is especially in a in a in an organization which which is operating across multiple uh, geographies um, i mean there is a lot of information needed across geographies so i think uh, from from uh, from my perspective uh, the biggest ask has been uh, for information uh, especially given the, the more than 50 plus jurisdictions where we operate so a lot of effort uh, has gone in by the team in trying to collate this information filtering the information and trying to present the most appropriate information to the to the uh, senior management and the board i think this has been one major ask and the other one has been a lot of focus on intercompany transactions corporate governance practices we have ramped up our uh, compliance function in terms of um, making the kyc onboardings all very more stringent so i think this from our perspective this has been the uh, the major asks uh, during this time Binod, th thank you very much for that. I mean, I, I just Abhijit, it'd be obviously useful to get your perspective on that. One thing that we've all discovered is uh, Zoom and Teams, and how have you gone about communicating with? You mentioned the fact that you've got uh, uh, you know nine uh, directors uh, that, that you report into uh, at various locations. How have you managed all of that? Well, I think nine is uh, really the owners of the entire empire. they are the ultimate shareholders from the hinduja family but then below them i work very closely with the ceos of many corporations around the world many of them are listed companies i myself am the board of many other companies in the group and then other than this i have got the business leaders with whom i have to communicate so therefore i think communication is a key you see our main problem is that 
we are accustomed to go to the office traditionally. Many a times we will communicate through telephone. Many times we will communicate through WhatsApp, WhatsApp calls. This is, these are all in addition to our physical meetings. Now suddenly you realize that there is no physical meeting. And these are all some kind of you know, virtual meetings which uh, we are not used to, at least you know, in our councils, we are not used to have this kind of physic, uh, you know, virtual meetings. So therefore, there's a challenge. Challenge in terms of everything. Challenge how to remain simple. Challenge how to communicate effectively in fewer words. Challenge how to really put across your views very, very effectively challenge how to even remain quiet when others are speaking because many times in the meetings we are not used to it when we are meeting physically always uh, there will be you know very lively interactions and all that whereas in a virtual meeting you really cannot do that so these are all the challenges so more discipline is needed in terms of communication how effectively we can communicate and when you are communicating with your own people, how to motivate them, how to, you know, uh, you know how, how, how to keep them completely engrossed into what exactly you are telling. So those things are really the challenges. Many times we are not used to it. As I said that we are used to go to the office traditionally. Now these things have gone. So this will uh, remain a, a, a big, big challenge for us. Yeah, thank you. Abhijat, and uh, just moving on to uh, Chetanea, um, what is the role of uh, technology in both managing the, the, uh, the COVID crisis uh, for an in-house team? Yeah, uh, I'm not going to be the most unbiased uh, commentator on this because I work at a tech company. Uh, but regardless- That's why we're asking you. <laughs> so I must say that it's been a complete lifesaver uh, it's just made life so much easier as an in-house lawyer uh, during these, um, you know, uh, unusual times that we're living through. Um, I also think that the one of the silver linings of this pandemic for um, in-house lawyers is I really think it gives us a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to modernize our legal departments and, uh, uh, you know, rely on technology to help us do our job better. I'll, I'll give you a few examples that, that uh, I really think have made my life easier. Uh, number one has to be... Uh, e-signatures. I mean, this is a technology that I think has really proven its value uh, <laughs> during the last three months. Um, I've been a, propon a proponent of signing everything uh, using uh, e-signatures and digital signatures for years. Um, and I think over the last few years, we've definitely seen more and more um, counterparties in our industry adopt e-signatures. But it's so heartening to see that trend uh, accelerating greatly uh, over the last couple of months. So I hope that that's something that sticks and um, uh, you know, we, we see e-signatures e being the standard in the future uh, rather than uh, wet signatures. Uh, another thing that I'm personally very excited about, uh, although I don't know how long this is going to last, is uh, online court hearings. I think especially in a massive country like India, it's just not feasible for uh, GCs to personally monitor hearings in different, you may have, you know, uh, one hearing every day of the week in a different part of the country and it's not practical to monitor those. If uh, online hearings become the norm, uh, and I think the jury is definitely out on that, uh, pun not intended, um, I think we'll, it'll be so much easier for uh, GCs to personally monitor uh, hearings in real time as they happen. So that, that's one that I, I really hope uh, sticks around in the future. A uh, couple of other technologies that I think have really uh, made my life easier. Um, we, uh, we do rely a lot on the automation of our most common contract types. And so that really frees up um, uh, the lawyer's time uh, and helps us focus on the areas where we really add value, uh, which is uh, customizing contracts and negotiating them uh, with counterparties uh, rather than uh, generating them. So uh, automating contracts, I think, has been a big game changer for us. Um, and then um, I think another uh, uh, symptom of the uncertain times we're living on is uh, I think uh, a lot of companies are keeping an eye on their costs. A lot of legal departments certainly uh, are keeping um, an eye on costs. And I think we have technology now that uh, not only uh, gives us a, a dashboard to look at all of our legal bills, 
Uh, but the most exciting part is it actually uh, lets us do analytics around that. So we can monitor trends in uh, our outside council spending, and then we can slice and dice it, you know, a dozen different ways. We can look at it month to month, quarter to quarter. We can compare different regions uh, within the same region or the same uh, jurisdiction. We can compare different firms. Uh, so I think that is really, um, uh, that, that, that's really helping us um, keep an eye on costs and uh, make our operations more efficient. So these, these are just a few examples. Uh, there are definitely many others. Uh, but I must say that uh, technology has been a real um, lifesaver for me. I think, I think we've all been uh, pleased that technology has been so robust during this, uh, this period of time. It's enabled all of us to work remotely in a way I don't think any of us anticipated. Um, Nilanjan, just moving on to you, what, what, what has been your efforts in regard to uh, technology and do you have any instructions to employees regarding uh, cyber risks? Uh, uh, look, uh, you know, in so far as technology is concerned, look, uh, just imagine uh, having a lot of money in your bank uh, account and not being able to withdraw it uh, because of there is social distancing or, or a lockdown. Uh, so as a bank, I think it's, it's uh, uh, we as a bank, it has been very, we've been very focused, unfortunately, uh, for a long time, uh, that all our customer uh, deliveries and customer services have moved uh, on to a digital platform. A uh, large part of our, whether it's lending, whether it is uh, uh, bread and butter, banking account, e-commerce, all of that has now moved uh, to a digital uh, uh, offering. Uh, <clears throat> what that means is that, you know, it, of course, from a cyber risk perspective, we also equally have a lot of customer information and uh, which is why the bank also has a lot of uh, you know policies around uh, you know dealing with with uh, uh, customer information so we have you know what i've seen happening is that again i am personally really not involved uh, but i can i have seen a, a lot more awareness being created uh, by us as uh, as banks within by our it uh, security uh, within the uh, bank itself to all bank employees we almost on a on a, on a daily basis uh, get reminders about um, you know being careful uh, with respect to uh, when we are working from home and remotely uh, equally we are uh, you know you will see a lot of uh, customer education happening uh, to customers you know where we're making customers aware of how uh, they should not fall prey to uh, to sort of uh, looking at uh, information they you know uh, which is being uh, done which is you know a lot, lot of you get some some time to link and that link may may actually uh, turn out to be a link which is just going to get into your uh, mobile and you know remotely swipe your mobile and you know sim card and whatever kind of thing uh, things sometimes i to me looks like very sci-fi but then uh, they are true uh, and so to me i think that the two things which uh, i would say that from a banking perspective, uh, it, it, we've already been uh, very, very digitally savvy. Uh, uh, fortunately, as a, even as a legal team, uh, we've been, uh, you know, quite, you know, at a risk of sounding pompous, but we've been a little ahead of the curve, uh, where we have uh, already had introduced things like a, a digital chatbot, where, you know, our branches all over the country, uh, uh, they don't need to come to a legal department. For, for a lot of queries, they can just uh, push it, you know, punch in their query and get the response. Now, and similar, you know, uh, such initiatives, we have a system of uh, sort of where we can digitally troll our, uh, you know, the court systems and, and get updates about what, what kind of matters are pending with ICICI and what are the next date, what are the hearing dates and what we need to, what are the orders. Uh, that happens remotely, digitally. So those, of course, are things which is not covid uh, triggered. These are uh, things which uh, we've been doing for some time now. Uh, so to honestly speaking, the, that has not been a challenge for us. So it's been very seamless for us to, to do. Insofar as what we are telling our employees, I think we've been only telling our employees for a long time, uh, very well, uh, you know, structured uh, policies around this. Uh, so nothing I would say new except just reminding uh, us to, to do the things which we've been doing for a long time. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, uh, over to Deepak. Uh, Deepak, uh, 
So what impact uh, do you see on um, contracts, especially force major frustration, those kind of events being discussed these days, and uh, also dispute resolution post COVID? Okay. Uh, Nidesh, first of all, when I talk about contracts, uh, the whole uh, the view about how you see risk mitigation and the risk mitigation advice that we need to give will con you know completely undergo a change at this moment. It's undergoing a change, in fact, right now also. Creditworthiness, for example, was not an issue for a lot of us in case of you know many clients now We're looking at you know credit lines again. Do you have credit backups? All those questions are there. Supply chain issues. These are the key issues for us at this moment. If, I mean, fourth major is one of these issues, which is, you know, again, uh, well documented. You've documented, it's there, you know, you deal with it. But some of these other issues that we are seeing going forward are going to be extremely, extremely important for us. Due diligence, whenever you're doing any acquisitions, becoming very challenging going forward. It's not going to be easy to do due diligences, especially look at it this way. If you're, if you're a real estate company, how do you do a due diligence in a property search? Very difficult in India at this moment. How do you do that? Yeah. Overall, the life cycle of a contract, you see that the life cycle of a contract will see that the overall turnaround time is going to change. It's going to come down in my view because negotiations cannot last the way it used to be earlier. People will use technology and negotiation time is actually going to come down. So there, as far as contracts are concerned, I feel these, these sort of changes are now going to be imminent as we go forward. When it comes to disputes, uh, I see the luxury litigation which has been happening in India will go away. We will see this, is, this pandemic will, will lead to the entire luxury litigation, the, the convenient litigation which is to happen will go away. Secondly, mediation and conciliation is going to pick up. You know, mediation is something which is not so active in India at this moment, but I'm, I'm clearly seeing, we, we were a part of a couple of, you know, last two months, we've been a part of one mediation and one conciliation proceedings this moment. So we clearly see that that's going to pick up because there is a desire now for people to do that. Lastly, again, you know, you're saying online arbitrations bound to pick up, bound to pick up. Chaitanya rightly pointed out, it's not possible that, you know, you can live with doing arbitrations across countries when you have this technology available. So that's again, something which is bound to happen. And lastly, technology by courts. What I foresee is that certain matters, the courts will themselves decide now going forward that these sort of matters will only be held through online or you know, technology you know, served hearings. So that's the way to go, I feel. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Deepak. And I'm just very conscious of time. We're going to be moving to the, the live webinar very soon. I'm just going to jump to a, a question for Abhijat. Um, we were seeing a lot uh, more interest in India becoming, becoming an alternative to, to China as a manufacturing hub for, say, global companies. How do you see COVID and, uh, and how India have dealt with it affecting this investment uh, going forward? I think the... The, your, your question is relevant, but it is linked to the political question. And you understand uh, where I am coming from. China is facing the heat now because of the reasons well known to everybody. Sitting in the West, I can say that uh, India has come into renewed focus once again because of uh, the many reasons and uh, it is connected with the political reason to start with. Why India has become the focus once again, because in the West there is a growing realization that China is using its money power to acquire businesses worldwide. Now that is happening in the last many years, but uh, unfortunately the Western nations, they really did not uh, give much credence or heat to it. Now they are giving. That's why we see in Germany, new laws have come in that uh, tomorrow, if you want to acquire uh, BMW, you won't be able to acquire that company. No matter whether you pick up shares from the market or not, we are seeing pan EU legislations are being brought in to prevent companies from China basically uh, to come and acquire companies here. We are seeing that in the UK, new regulations have been brought in. We are seeing in the UK, there's a debate going on where, whether they will be permitted to get into the uh, 5G business or not. So the bottom line is that P 
people are relooking their economic model, people are relooking their business model, nations are looking the way they are doing business now, nations are looking into their supply chain management, everybody is looking into what is happening. Now, obviously, China is a huge country. So if you don't want to do much or if you want to restrict, then where is the alternative? And that is where the alternative right now for the time being is focused on India. My final line will be that it is for India to free up policies, to remain very stable in terms of policy decisions, not to keep changing the policies time in and again. And then uh, decisions should be taken very fast. There's a golden opportunity. So I see that uh, there will be renewed interest on India. And if India can catch up with the expectation, it will be a good place to start business. Thank you, Abhijit Da. And thank you for this. Uh, now, before we head up to the Q&A session, uh, we have a very interesting and fun new segment, uh, which is part of the which is part of almost all talk shows now, which is called the rapid fire round. So here we're going to ask about three questions uh, to each participant and uh, would like uh, to know your one word or maximum one sentence response uh, to the question. Uh, Param, over to you. Okay, well, I'm not sure I'm a, a host on a quiz show or anything like that, but I'll give it a go. Give it a go. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Jidesh. Uh, start, starting off with the... Nilajan, uh, what is the one great learning during this uh, pandemic for you personally? Need more t-shirts and shorts. White shorts, shirts are not good enough. Okay, excellent. That's, that's what we want. Rapid. Deepak? You're on mute, you're mute, Deepak. I think it is effective use of technology for legal okay. function. Yeah. Excellent. Tatiana? I'm just uh, amazed at how uh, adaptable and resilient uh, we human beings are and how we've taken this in our stride. Okay, excellent. Vinod? I, in a purely lighter win, I think uh, pay your life insurance premium on time. <laughs> and, on a, and on a serious note, I think uh, the importance of family, family time. Yeah, excellent. And Abhijat? I think uh, remain smart. And when you say remain smart, it has got many uh, dimensions. You know, remain smart uh, in terms of your family, remain smart in terms of creativity, innovativeness, etc. So therefore, this is my take. You remain smart and do whatever you want to do. Okay, excellent. And uh, the next question, and uh, once again, I'll start with uh, Neil Ajahn, and uh, he, he may mention his dog, but uh, did you pick up an interest and hobby to, uh, to beat the stress of the uh, COVID-19? And, and what was that? So I have actually started re-reading re uh, Bengali literature. You know, uh, there is uh, Satyajit Ray, and uh, and uh, and I've discovered the marvel of reading uh, Satyajit Ray's short stories and taking him into a dream world, uh, okay. and, and then and just relating that stories over dinner time with my family. Uh, that's okay. been a great stress buster. That's a great way to spend time. Deepak. Well, honestly, this has been a very demanding time. You know, others may agree that this has been a very demanding time. But uh, what we've done is that we've started this legal social aid. So we've been providing social aid within the company. We employ about 20,000 people. Right. We're trying to help people with bills and power of attorneys and such stuff, whatever is important to them. Yeah, well, so very satisfying, personally. Good. Yeah. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, Chatiania? Um, for, for me, I've been working on improving my guitar playing. <laughs> <laughs> we may have some time for that uh, at the end, okay? <laughs> Vinod? Yeah, I signed up for a course on the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, I was always fascinated by it. Uh, and 10 chapters down the line, I just realized I skimmed the surface. Long way to go. <laughs> Abhijit? I think I'm trying to be more spiritual, trying to spend more time with myself, trying to introspect what I'm doing right, what I'm not doing right, what are the changes I should bring in. Yeah. Fantastic. And the final quick question, uh, what's your advice to in-house lawyers to be successful at GCs? And we'll start off with, again, with uh, Nilajan. So my advice is, uh, so that means that, you know, uh, uh, there is really no uh, shortcut to becoming a successful GC. Uh, you know, you need to uh, sort of give, give it time to, to you know, get some... Uh, 
training under some great mentor, uh, you know, for, for a prolonged period to, for you to become really a successful GC. So rather than a quick and the first GC job, uh, that's why I said Lager Ho. Okay. And uh, Deepak? So you unmute Deepak, sorry. Yes, sorry. So understand your business, build acceptability within the organization, inculcate a habit of, you know, answering in yes or a no, and take very fair positions whenever you negotiate. <laughs> well, I look, look forward to negotiating with you. That's going to be the case then. Okay. Uh, Chatanya? Uh, for me, it's uh, number one is uh, pick an industry that you're passionate about. Uh, assert your independence as a lawyer and try and uh, listen more than you speak. Okay, that, that's very good advice. Thank you. Vinod? Yeah, um, I think um, cut out the legalese, uh, speak like the business, speak with the business without uh, lowering your guard. Yeah, and uh, Abhijit? Remain a business focused general counsel because, as I said at the beginning, if the business remains, then general counsels also remain. That is the fundamental. Well, thank you very much for those quick uh, fire answers. So I'm now going to pass back to uh, Jidesh. Thank you. Thanks uh, to all the panelists for this fun round. Now we'll uh, open uh, the floor to questions. Uh, Akshay, uh, we have some. Um, uh, speakers, or uh, I, I see that there are about 90 plus questions, as well as uh, there are a few live questions right now. So, should we take that up first, or uh, should we do the uh, audio round of the QA? Do we have a queue up? Sure, Jadesh, uh, let's take some live questions first. Sure. Mr. Christopher Hayes, can you please ask your question live? Hi, right, well, a huge thanks to Jadesh and, and Palm for what has been a really interesting um, uh, debate. I think my question is to the panel is around sort of how best that GCs can advise businesses given the huge uncertainty that there is across the globe at the moment. I mean, you take into consideration, obviously, India's lockdown laws have now been devolved down to the state level. It's the same in the US. In the UK, you have four different um, entities all having different um, sort of rules and regulations. So, how do you, how do you cut through that? And also, how um, do you balance the need between the minimum legal requirements and what is actually the best practice? Abhijitha, do you want to take that up? Yeah, I can do it. I think everything is not doom and gloom. Uh, you know, vaccine is coming, so do not worry. In the UK. Uh, the production has already started or is going to start anytime soon. Although the government uh, is putting a rider right there that once it is approved, so that means the vaccine is coming. And once the vaccine is coming and uh, human beings are as race, extremely resilient. You know, what happened in Second World War, the entire Europe and parts of Asia were destroyed and they have all come back and bounced back. You see, the thing is that there are $10 trillion which many countries, especially the G20 countries, they have offered as stimulus. So I'm very, very hopeful that once that money starts coming in, obviously there will be opportunities, the business will restart. We came across 1930s Great Depression. We overcame the Second World War and the world is becoming more and more uh, richer than it was 50 years back. So it is a question of opportunity. Human beings uh, you know, definitely have got the, the, the minds and uh, you know, interest of their own. They will certainly come up with ideas which will be translated into more economic activity, activities. I'm very optimistic about it. Now our role as GC, that, that there will be a testing time because the traditional role will uh, you know, slowly, slowly disappear. How quickly we adapt to the business requirements, how quickly we become innovative, how quickly we become creative, because businesses will come back with all kinds of creative ideas. And if we are up to speed, if we can support them, then certainly as GC, we will remain successful. All right, uh, can I speak? Oh. All right. So myself, Cyril Jacob, 
Can you hear me? Very clearly, Mr. Sir Jacob, please. please yeah, please okay. Yes. So my question is regarding uh, force major. Any of you can answer it, answer it, though I heard Deepak Chauhan very light, slightly mentioning about it. So I believe, you know, I've come across certain documents where it is mentioned that force major, the clause happens to be very biased towards the customers. You know, it affects the stand of business owners. This in respect of rental agreements, you know, because many people who are on rent during the pandemic, they were not paying their rents on time. So how does force major come into play? If somebody could be more specific on this. Niranjan, do you want to take this up or? I mean, look, uh, this has uh, to extend. I think the answer is there in uh, already uh, there in the uh, one of the judgments, if I remember, of the Delhi High Court. Uh, first and foremost, in India, the concept of force majeure doesn't exist. Uh, uh, seldom would you have a force majeure kind of circumstances mentioned uh, in a rent agreement. Uh, I don't think uh, a force majeure uh, can be called, you know, in a pandemic kind of thing. Situation can uh, is is a force majeure event and. I'll be very surprised that you know a rent agreement, if you were to say, uh, contemplates a force majeure, uh, a pandemic as a, as a force majeure event, even if when you've negotiated this. So for us, in the context of Indian law, it does not exist. It is either a frustration of contract, and therefore, if you uh, cancel the lease agreement, and you can, you're welcome to to vacate it. Uh, so, uh, and this, I think, has already been upheld by the by, by the Delhi High Court, or, or uh, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, so the way to go, according to me, is is not uh, using legal negotiation, uh, legal card, you know, sort of tools, but it is through negotiation. You know, you sit down with with people, and particularly in commercial contract, uh, uh, what I hear is that people are sitting down and negotiating and saying that look, let's negotiate and uh, uh, look at what it, what is uh, works for both. Now that's the way uh, I think it it should work. Sure. Um, uh, uh, Cyril, uh, um, to add to what uh, Nilanjan said, uh, clearly the, uh, the term force measure, uh, you know, is uh, not uh, does not uh, derive its right from any uh, pro any provisions of the Act. So it is a contractual right between two parties. It's a contractual arrangement. So if it is decided as to what is a force measure then you also have to look at what are the uh, um, issues revolving around the force measure event, uh, whether your event, whether this event is part of your force measure. If not, look at other things. For example, uh, there are various doctrines that you can think of. For example, there's a doctrine of suspension of rent, there's a doctrine of impossibility, doctrine of improbability. And of course, there's also this, uh, uh, every um, uh, agree, rental agreement or lease agreement would also have a term vis-a-vis -vis, uh, peaceful possession of the property. So that could also be used because you know nobody is giving you peaceful possession of the property. So you could also negotiate back. So like Nilanjan said, it's really commercial legal solution rather than purely legal solution or a purely uh, commercial uh, you know, uh, solution. Yeah, Jidesh, if I can add, in the rent agreement, it's very difficult to get any kind of force major clause. And we face this problem uh, where either we are renting out or we are taking rent. So it is really a problem. But in the commercial contract, especially in the West, there is a concept of force measure. Say, for example, in the banking contract, there is nothing like force measure. And today, in several cases, we are renegotiating re with the banks that because of the pandemic, whether it is possible to renegotiate the contract, but we are at the mercy of the bankers because you know, if the lenders don't agree, then of course you can't renegotiate. Whereas in case of business contracts, we are suffering in both ways, where we have promised to deliver certain, uh, for example, vehicles or goods, etc., on time. Many times we are facing the customers are using the force major clause and telling that we are unable to accept that delivery. So we have to fight out that. Whereas on the other hand where the, we can exercise our force major because of the pandemic we are doing it. But at the end of the day, it is quite a contentious issue and I can completely agree with Nilanjan, every time you can't use your legal remedy and then go and fight with the other side, you have to sit down 
and you have to come to certain terms in the spirit of give and take and then solve the matter in a commercial way rather than in a legal way. And Gidesh, I would just make a very quick observation. I think in terms of the relationship between parties will change. So when it comes to real estate going forward, the relationship between the developer, the landowner, uh, the landlord and the tenant in terms of if you cannot use a facility, then why are you paying rent? And so that's one of the key things that will change. And also we've talked about during this panel how will work more remotely, more people will work remotely, so there'll be less use of office space, even though there are well-being benefits for teams to get together. So I think that's going to be something that's going to be a big negotiation uh, going forward. Thank you. The thing I asked is because uh, I had drafted a lease agreement with this particular force major clause, and it had me thinking whether I made a foolish mistake of including it, or was I acting in overconfidence? Uh, Jitesh, sir, you're not audible. Mr. Jitesh, please unmute yourself. Yeah, can we move to the next question? Yeah, Ms. Karima Sharma, please ask your question live. Yeah, uh, this is question to all the panelists. Uh, kindly just elaborate what best safeguards can the legal department take in to avoid the technical risk at these stages of the e-contracts, especially uh, during this e-signatures and e-witnesses. If you could just elaborate a little bit on it. Nilanjan, again, you, because it, this is, yeah. No, I, I, I think, uh, I, I... I would only say that you've got to have a credible service provider uh, you, uh, who you would be using for uh, the e-signature platform. Uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, that, that uh, I think is there because, you know, really what you're looking at is that the service provider ha plays a part and a role in, in getting this uh, signature done. Uh, the other uh, thing to do is that uh, from a perspective is that, look, uh, the e-signatures could be in the form of either in, in Indian context an Aadhaar-based e-signature, uh, or it could be mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, you know a digital signature which is done through if you know through flash drives which you know which is there. A uh, lot of time, what happens is that if you are the signatory, uh, because you know it is like uh, is somebody forging your signature. Uh, mm -hmm. You know if uh, so. Similarly, if uh, somebody else uh, has been given access to that. So when it comes to an Aadhaar based signature or th things like that, there is a biometric and there is, you know, it's just, I think, uh, simpler. But if it comes to, you know, one of those uh, flash drive based uh, e-signatures, uh, then you have to be careful that there is no misuse of the signature, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so th therefore it has to be kept in safe custody. Uh, it has to be uh, authorized to be used. In so far as we are concerned, we want to also want to try and ensure that the the company uh, and the you know in the context of two corporates, the company has actually authorized uh, execution of this uh, documents through uh, a digital mode, and that is recorded if it's a you know board resolution authorization that, that covers that. Uh, those would be to me uh, just more. I mean, I would say it's more operational risks than mm -hmm. any legal risks. I don't really see a legal risk as such in in doing it. The risks are operational. Mm -hmm. I think Garima, in addition to what uh, Nilanjan has said, I will say eventually try to get the hard copy and physical copy signed by the signatories also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And that's uh, what I just want to do, just to mention that. Because we still, uh, in the, there will be still a lot of technical risks that will evolve in this uh, era that we are still evolving into. Thank you, Ms. Karima. Uh, over to you, Jadesh. You, you may now address the question in the Q&A box. We're receiving interests and requests from attendees to address questions in the Q&A box as well. Thank so, you. So we have time for just one or two questions because we, uh, yeah. So this is, uh, this question is from uh, Sunita Jatyani um, of uh, Mahindra Kombiva. So her question is, uh, if a contract does not contain uh, contrary clauses, can we invoke force major clause from governing law of contract uh, in order to terminate the contract or to delay the obligations? So which one of you would like to take this up? 
I can answer from the practical experience, Jidesh. Yes. Yes. It's a very good question. Unfortunately, I think, Jidesh, you also said force measure is arising out of the contractual provisions. Yes. Unless there is a contractual requirement, we can't bring force measure. Like earlier, I gave the example of lenders, because in any lending arrangement, you won't find any force measure. And if there is no force measure, you cannot bring it. So therefore, if the contract says force measure, you can always rely on that. But then, you know, to prove force measure itself, there is an element of cause and effect relationship. So to prove that, to establish that, things are not so easy. And in the pandemic situation, we are having the same difficulty, whether pandemic can be, uh, can trigger force major or not, uh, there is a, some element of, you know, doubt in that. So we are relying on government regulations. If the government says in this pandemic situation, you can't work, you should stop working. Then obviously we are not only depending upon the force major clause, we are depending upon the government uh, regulations clause also, unable to work due to government uh, restrictions. And, and just to add, uh, no, sorry, Deepak. Yeah, yeah. Just to add uh, to your point regarding governing law, at least in Indian context, only the frustration of contract would help you, but that will only give you a remedy to terminate, but not to suspend the contract. So, uh, just one last question before we conclude this. Uh, this is from uh, uh, Freni Patel. What Freni asks is. Um, uh, with the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic, are you going to be hiring a lot more lawyers or are you, are you going to be uh, using a lot of external counsel? I think there's also a personal interest to both me and Parant. Well, uh, I can start off on that because we've just hired uh, two from the campus and we've stood by our commitment and, and we've hired, they've joined us in June. And as I had mentioned earlier, this is a great time for us to you know, impart training and learning to them. So we, we have continued. We are centering our team at this moment. So I, 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 I feel maybe perhaps other corporate would do the same. Okay. I think right now we are all on suspension mode. Just wait and see what happens. Once we open up, then certainly you know, we will take a call on that. It It's a cost-benefit analysis kind of thing because if the businesses can really continue to make money in the foreseeable future, definitely we will hire and we will engage more external lawyers also. Thank you. Thanks, Adan. Thanks. Uh, Very positive note on uh, which to finish this. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. before I conclude the event, I wanted to point out that uh, any unanswered questions will be taken up offline and uh, we'll reach out to you with uh, some response. I would now like to uh, conclude this webinar with a note of thanks to Lex Witness for setting up this platform. I also want to thank all of you for being an excellent uh, audience. Um, at the same time, I also want to, uh, last but not least, I also want to thank our family members who have let us participate in this webinar without much disturbance. So good evening and uh, have a great weekend. Good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.